What's up, YouTube? Um, I'm back. 6 p.m. Um, Tim Hussock with another musical musing, I suppose, live on YouTube and Facebook. Um, and today's topic is mixing music for TV and films. Ten things I wish I had known uh, ten years ago. Uh, things which I kind of I now have. They, they've basically changed my life, changed the way I make music, and you know massively for the better um so without further ado i shall crack on if you are new to the channel on youtube then by all means hit subscribe and get involved so you'll be the first to find out whenever i post any other stuff um and similarly on facebook obviously you can't subscribe but like poke whatever poke's not a thing anymore on facebook is it um so the 10 things that has changed my life regarding mixing for tv and film so first of all the caveat i'm not a mix engineer i am very much a composer producer who mixes a lot of my own work um i don't advertise as a mix engineer and i don't generally i have mixed other people's projects but generally i'm always mixing my own work so this is coming very much from that angle um and the first element that has changed my life for the better um is mixing as a completely separate element or a completely separate stage so if you're a producer or composer you'll be in your door of choice mine's logic tinkering away creating arrangements and sort of adding the production elements etc 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 and you're kind of mixing as you go but maybe not and then you get to the end and then you sort of go okay well i should probably mix it so you then start tinkering with that but what i do is i take off all other than creative effects, I take off all the reverb, um, all the sort of like tomfoolery like that, and I export everything as audio. I import it into a new project and I mix from scratch. So some people are probably listening and going, but Jim, that seems crazy because it's going to take you a lot longer. And yes, it is. It does take longer. However, there are major, major benefits to doing this. First of all, you're working with audio. So you can't go into sort of your, your your VSTs and start tinkering and changing sounds and things like that. You've committed and therefore you have to work with what you've committed to. Um, but second of all, it's just about the mindset of you are starting from scratch. Like obviously when you're writing and producing, you're making creative decisions on the fly. And a lot of those, you know, is in the, in the moment and you will probably trust those and go with them. However, when it comes to mixing coming in with a fresh perspective and re-leveling everything and going in and recompressing everything when you are literally only listening to mix elements rather than harmonic elements rather than rhythmic elements it's it's a different process and i can't speak highly enough of treating mixing as a separate stage export everything to audio create a new project and start from scratch it's it changed my life and it um, has massively massively helped my mixes um, so that's tip number one uh, tip number two um, is referencing. Referencing um, is something that I always heard about and always went, yeah, 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 makes sense, yeah, referencing, yeah, of course, I'm, I'm going to reference. Um, and it's only something that I've really properly started doing in the last six months. When I'm talking about referencing, we're talking about having a track mixed by a super engineer, um, mixed by like a legend of um, engineering or mixing, uh, to sound as amazing as possible in as mo many different environments as possible so anything on spotify or you know whatever but so for, say for example i'm working on a trailer track then i get up a hand zimmer track i'd whack it into my project my logic project and i'd have it there so that i can quickly toggle between my mix and hand zimmer's mix well obviously he didn't mix it himself um it's not enough to press stop on your door go into spotify press play the, you need to be able to toggle in a millisecond between the two tracks because it's only then that it reveals the necessary differences between the two tracks and your ear can pick up it. So referencing is so, it's literally changed my life for the better. And it's something that I heard about for years and I always thought, yeah, it makes sense, but I was just never doing it properly. So get your reference track, but be able to toggle between them super quick. Um, Number three, or before I go on to number three, by the way, this is uh, interactive. So if you do have any specific questions that you want to fire out or any comments, um, do hit me up in the chat and I will uh, address them. Um, yes, yeah, tip number three is master bus compression. So with uh, a lot of the kind of uh, you know younger producers and composers that I work with, I think there's sometimes a sort of misunderstanding or, or a lack of understanding about what master bus compression is. So what I do, uh, and it's again, it's been a bit of a game changer, is I get all my levels without any master bus compression. 
Um, I get it all set. I get it all sounding as good as possible without doing any compressing. And then I will add a compressor on the stereo out, the master bus. Now this compressor is just basically doing a bit of heavy lifting of what's there already um, to sort of you know bring everything down just sort of glue it all together you don't want to be smashing it hard obviously there are creative uses of master, master bus compression but i'm talking just purely in the sense of having it on your master bus doing a bit of light compression um so that it just sort of glues everything together and it makes some of your mix uh decisions uh, a bit easier um point number four and this is again something that I've only done fairly recently. And actually, when I interviewed Guy Massey for my uh, podcast, um, he actually mixes through a limiter all the time. Um, but I, once I've started sort of my mix and it's getting to a place where I'm happy with it, I will put on a limiter and I will limit it. Because again, it's a very revealing process. And ultimately, you should always, always, always be sending people music that is limited. Even last year, I was sending, because I sometimes forget, I was sending clients tracks without a limiter on it. And they would come back with feedback like, don't like the mix, it feels flat and lifeless. Pop a limiter on it and smash the crap out of it, send it back, all of a sudden they love it. I didn't change anything other than the loudness. And that's the reality of the loudness war is we generally perceive louder things as better. So don't ever, if you're sending music to a, a publisher or a music library or a production music library, whatever it is, make sure you always limit it. Even with the writer's circle I work with, some of the guys send through tracks that aren't limited. And even I have to sort of catch myself because they don't sound quite as good as the tracks that have been limited just because they're simply not as loud. Um, but make sure you're limiting. And actually, as you know, final part of the mix process, I'm mixing through the limiter. What I used to do was get my mix ready. And just as I'm doing the mastering, I sort of put a limiter on it and that was it. But actually, I do it much earlier on, and I spend quite a bit of the sort of latter stages of my mix process mixing through the stereo bus compressor and the limiter. Um, number four, pan hard, or is it number five? I can't remember. Pan hard or go home. Um, I think this is particularly relevant to mixing with TV and film. I mean, it's it's, it's the same thing, whether it's TV and film or, or commercial releases. Um, but panning with TV and film, with music that's you know used for sync, uh, generally you will have a voiceover. So if it's in show, there's quite often going to be dialogue on top. Um, if it's a you know a fictional piece, if it's a, you know like daytime TV, there might be a narration or voiceover on it. If it's a trailer, you might have dialogue and a voiceover. So that dialogue, that voiceover, will always sit in the middle of the stereo spectrum. So making sure that you've got plenty of width and spread to your mix leaves space in the middle for the voiceover. Um, so... I remember when I started uh, sort of mixing, I'd, my, my, my panning would be a bit ooh, a bit to the right, a bit to the left, smash it hard left and right. Um, don't be afraid to. It's called LCR, left, center, right um, mixing. Um, I Some people don't subscribe to sort of having little bits here and there. I, I personally do, but always like to get the maximum width out of my mix because a big wide mix creates excitement and energy. So um, pan hard or go home. Um, I'm going to take a breather there because I'm conscious I'm chatting at a mile a minute. Um, what we've got here, uh, Ollie Barton in the house. Hi, Jim. Great advice on referencing. Being able to AB with reference tracks is super important. Open your eyes and ears to how your mix is coming up short. Yeah, totally. Um, and that's actually a, an interesting point, Ollie, because um, because we tend to mix in the box, we become very dependent on what we see. So quite often, if I'm mixing a track, I will switch the lights off and do this. Um Partly it shifts the stereo spectrum, so I'm listening to it slightly differently, but also I'm just not looking at anything. I'm not looking at bar, you know, um, a, a bar moving. I'm not looking at blocks in logic. Um, so, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Um, right, I'm, let me have a quick glass of sugar water. Um, low end. Uh, low end bass sub sort of frequencies is an area where... I increasingly notice with people who are sort of starting out struggling, and I know that I did. I used to, uh, I used to mix in a broom cupboard. Uh, my studio before this one was literally a small broom cupboard uh, in a studio complex. It was triangular. It was the worst possible shape. I had a pair of Yamaha HS5 monitors uh, that have almost no low end whatsoever, and certainly in that room, even though I treated it, it was it was a nightmare. So one thing to say about low end is the environment that you're mixing in goes a long way to helping you and be able to sort of hear what it is you're trying to do second of all your monitors will go a long way to that as well 
that's obviously something I can't really sort of talk about here. But I had an example with someone uh, in a writer's circle last week whereby, you know, they're in a bedroom. Uh, they don't have any sort of treatment. They're using sort of basic monitors, I think. Um, Isabella, if you're watching, you know, it's you. Um, and they were having trouble getting separation between the sort of the base, the subby synth base or sine wave they had and their kicks, um, partly because of the room. But my advice on that was if you haven't got a great space and you haven't got amazing monitors, you can just make life so much easier for yourself by as you're writing or producing, making decisions based on frequency. So, for example, if you've got a sine wave, a really low end subby sine wave bass, try and pick a kick drum which isn't like an 808 subby kick drum it's something with a bit more sort of mid and a bit more high end a bit more snap and crack to it because that way it just makes life easier when you're mixing it's like they're not competing in the same space uh, and conversely if you've got a really subby sort of 808 then you can use a bass but sort of like don't have a select a bass sound that isn't sort of all in the low end or sort of like really sort of sub heavy it just goes a long way to sort of helping you from the beginning so you're not battling quite as hard now i know there's some people probably go no jim but what about side chaining etc etc it's like yes side chaining is a very uh you know you know relevant way particularly if you're doing edm and stuff like that but my personal thoughts are is that you don't necessarily need to be employing advanced techniques to get separation between your bass uh, instruments in the beginning as you go on yes but i think when you're starting out it kind of can complicate things but just make life easier for yourself in terms of the choosing the sounds or samples that you're using and making sure that they're not kind of fighting each other exactly the same goes for you know higher up the frequencies like if you're for example you've, you've got a piano part which is sort of very kind of in a sort of like you know low mid midi section if you've got a guitar as well by voicing your chords higher up the guitar neck you're again reducing the amount of competition there is frequency wise between the guitar and the piano so little choices like that in terms of orchestration or how you're playing things or chord voicings can go a long way to helping the mix you know the final mix um what else have we got uh yeah and this one's a good one ignore prescriptive videos on youtube so the reason I say this, um, now whilst there is a wealth of great information out there on YouTube, and God knows I've consumed a lot of it, quite often you have amateurs uh, advising amateurs. And when I was an amateur being advised by other amateurs, I was picking up little tidbits of information here, which, know it or not, I adopted, and it's actually held me back. So one thing specifically was, I don't know whether I picked it up on a Gear Sluts forum or mix, certainly not mixed with the Masters, but it was a YouTube video or something whereby everyone was saying, oh, you should never, you should always use reductive EQ, you should never use additive EQ, EQ which is it's just absolute nonsense. It's like, to my mind, it's like, certainly when I'm in the initial stage of my mix and I'm trying to clear out space and stop instruments avoiding, you know, competing with each other, yes, reductive EQ is my go-to. However, latterly in the mix, if I've got a really nice sort of acoustic guitar, I want to be boosting those high-end frequencies. And similarly with a vocal, I'm going to be boosting frequencies. So I was reading this a lot of places where people were saying, oh, you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't use additive EQ, you should only use, and it's like, it's absolute nonsense. And there is a lot of nonsense out there on YouTube. I'm trying not to be prescriptive. I am literally sharing things that I've learned. I'm not saying this is how you should or shouldn't do it. These are just things which have helped me, which they may or may not help you. You can you can take it or you can send it right back. Um, but yes, yeah, so just be cautious in terms of information that you hear on the internet um, because uh, there is no right and wrong when it comes to mixing. It's a creative process. So be creative, do your thing, um, and yeah, don't hold back as a result of what somebody may or may not have said. Um, the next point, I don't even know where we are. Think, yeah, we're on eight. Um, mix in mono. Um, this, again, has been a sort of game changer for me. Um, one, Obviously, one of the main things we're trying to do when we're mixing is we're trying to sort of create separation. We're trying to create separation between instruments. Um, and one way to do that is hard panning left and hard panning right. So if you've got two instruments which are competing in the same frequency range, by hard panning them left and right, we create that separation. Great. Great until it's summed down to mono, which probably is happening less and less with modern technology. But you know, people still 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 do listen on devices where it comes down, you know, summed down to mono. And depending on where you're listening within the stereo spectrum, 
The problem is when you do sum down to mono, those frequencies are then competing because you don't have the stereo separation. So by mixing in mono, first of all, you have to work a little bit harder to get separation between the instruments. But what that means is when you do then flip it back into stereo, it's like, wow, it's night and day. But it's just the idea of making sure that your mix translates from a, from stereo into mono. And mixing in mono, just it, it just helps you to ensure that when it does go back in stereo that everything's going to be working together and you're not relying on the hard panning left and right to create the separation which will disappear when you sum to mono another quick point on that as well is from what i gather from reading sound on sound um if you it's much better to have a single mono source rather than summing two sources down to mono so i've got two monitors here i've got a button here which will turn it into a mono signal that isn't quite the same as having just a single speaker so what you can't see is i've got a little advantone a mix cube here just a, a mono mix cube which i quite often am switching between when i'm mixing when i want to sort of drill down into sort of sounds um, and get sort of like a real detail with sort of carving out frequencies oh i'm gonna take another breather um ollie barton bane of bane is ollie reckons uh low end frequencies bane of my existence um yeah i think you and uh, a lot of other people ollie it's it's a tricky one to navigate um and as i say particularly the room and your speakers go a long way to sort of Im impeding you um, and as far as you've got another comment here, what's this? Um, it's funny, I think reductive EQ thing is basically a product of producers being overzealous with additive EQ, whereas when they cut frequency, people tend to be more conservative. Yeah, quite possibly. I mean, I think, you know, it's it's a case of both. You know, you, we can reduce frequencies. I mean, basically, you know, EQ is, a, is essentially volume control. So you're either boosting or reducing. But to say that you shouldn't do one or you should do the other, certainly when you're creating space, it's better rather than turning things up to sort of, you know, turn things down. But certainly when you kind of bring out bring out certain frequencies, I, you know, I, for me, you've got to be boosting stuff. Um, and it seems counterintuitive to try and achieve that by, you know, reducing certain frequencies with everything else. But as I say, it's not, you know, there is no right and wrong. Um, OK, so the last two uh, elements on my list um, is bold strokes. Something my mixes have always been guilty of is they're just too polite. I sit there and I want it all to be nice and I want to be able to sort of hear everything and everything sort of like quietly ticking away in the background. Whereas you've got to think of a mix as like the mix process is about adding excitement and energy to a piece of music. So being bold with decisions, making decisions as to, OK, what are my main instruments? What are going to be front and foremost? What, you know, what elements are going to be sort of pushed back a bit and what's going to be right in the background? But be bold, you know, um, an example of something I was sort of providing notes on for uh, ASX the other day. Um, where someone had these sort of like little glitchy sounds but they were like really pushed back in the background I was like that's really cool and it's kind of very very unique so like bring it up in volume bring it to the front um, and let's hear it so yeah be bold when you're mixing just sort of like be you know think of a painter throwing paint at a canvas I think sometimes with mixing it's a bit like that don't be too sort of cautious and um, well certainly I have been in the past too cautious and polite with my mixing and by just being a bit bold a bit more kind of out there um, I think my mixes have massively uh, improved. Um, and the final point um, is distortion. Um, distortion, I've kind of discovered in the last few years, but um, quite often before I even start EQing stuff, I will whack different distortion processes on things because it tends to bring out certain frequencies. And sometimes you can bring out those frequencies without even hitting, touching an EQ. But it also, I don't know if you've seen um, the... Um, one of my other videos on sort of how to make MIDI more real. As human beings, we are predisposed to liking slight in in you know imperfections in sound, whether that's you know imperfections in rhythm or imperfections sonically. Like all of the you know most people are using plugins these days, which are emulating gear from the 60s and 70s, analog gear, which when you put that sound through circuitry, it imparts harmonic distortion. It creates these little tonal imperfections, and we like that sort of thing. So get playful with with distortion because I feel like doing that and adding distortion to things certainly it can counter the sort of if you suffer from polite mixes like I have, um, it can counter that. But at the same time, it's also a great way to sort of you know bring out certain frequencies without um, uh, reaching for EQs. So there you go, there are my uh, ten top tips. I will just summarize them real quick. Um, I don't need to because you can go, no, I will. You can still go back and watch the video. Um, treat mixing as a separate process. So don't try and mix as you go, particularly if you're starting out. Bounce everything out as audio, start a new project and mix, mix from scratch. That's how mix engineers are generally doing it. And I think that's the best way to focus your energy in terms of getting better at mixing. 
uh, referencing. Make sure you have a reference in your project and you can toggle, or not even in your project, but you have the ability to toggle between the tracks really quickly. It's not enough to just stop it and move on to a different, uh, onto Spotify. Um, master bus compression. Um, once you've got your levels and everything sort of feeling good, pop a master bus compression on there, some light compression, um, because that really just sort of helps to glue things together a little bit and bring out, you know, it helps to, I think, to improve your what you're hearing. Um, pan hard or go home. The idea of, you know, be liberal with your panning. You don't have to be sort of like too um, timid with panning. You can pan hard left, pan hard right. Create, create, create a nice, exciting, wide stereo mix, particularly with TV and film stuff, because quite often there might be dialogue over the top of your music. So really make use of that stereo field. Uh, low end, um, rather than reaching for, you know, um, a parallel compression and that sort of thing, just with the instrument selection or the sample selection, make sure you're selecting sounds which aren't going to compete with each other. We're talking about bass and kicks in that respect. Uh, limiting, never send a track that hasn't been limited because if it doesn't sound as loud, people will assume it's not as good. Um, but also you can add the limiter on sort of at the later stages of your mix process to make sure your mix is kind of popping. Uh, ignore prescriptive videos on YouTube. I, I'd like to think that this video isn't prescriptive. I'm just literally sharing my thoughts and things that have helped me. So feel free to reject or adapt, adopt as you see fit. Um, mix in mono, uh, something huge to be said for being able to sum something to mono and get into the detail of it um, to sort of really help your mix uh, sort of be, be clear when it back out in stereo or as and when it's summed to mono. Um, Bold strokes, don't be too polite, just go crazy, throw paint at a canvas, uh, and distortion. Use distortion um, because it, you can just have a lot of fun with it and it just makes things sound better, I kind of think. Um, so there you go. Oh, I've got a couple of comments here. Todd Baker, guitar. Yes, Satin and FF Satin, Young Jim. So um, Todd uh, is a, uh, well, Todd Baker, guitar, is a phenomenal composer and sound designer as well, has taught me a lot over the years. Um, and yeah, he. I don't actually have satin. It's some um, fab filter satin. Um, satin, I do have. Um, I have to say, Todd, I, it's, I never really go to it. In terms of distortion, like I tend to go to um, Sound Toys Decapitator to the point where it's a bit of an addiction, and I really need to kind of broaden my um, distortion horizons. Um, but um, yeah, satin. It does. I've you know I've have heard satin is very good, and maybe that'll be on my Black Friday um, wish list. Um, and what's this are you saying as well pan hard general rule of thumb with the higher frequencies though oh, yes okay that is a good point um you don't want to be panning uh, bass frequencies bass keep it in the middle um bass kicks anything sort of low end keep it in the middle but when it comes to higher frequencies um and <laughs> there's a uh, there's a comment here rob from robert swift if there was an 11th thing what <laughs> that you wish you'd known what would it be uh yeah, uh, I don't know. Oh, actually, that does remind me. Um, so there was a, a question from Olivia um, who was asking about uh, mixing Americana, if I had any sort of tips or hints for mixing Americana. Um, I don't, uh, I'm afraid, uh, Olivia. I think, I don't know, but I would say that generally if you're mixing Americana, I think the mix principles would be generally the same. I don't think there'd be anything drastically different to a, a, an Americana mix. I suppose it depends whether you're going for kind of like a more traditional Americana or whether it's like a more kind of modern pop production Americana a la sort of, you know, some of Taylor Swift stuff. I think generally if you've got a pop mix, things are compressed a bit harder. Whereas if you've got a, um, and, and maybe even things are a bit brighter. Whereas if you're sort of going for a more traditional, you'll probably have sort of more kind of um, a kind of vintagey sound so you won't have as much sort of like high-end um, boosting um, and it'll just sort of be a bit more sort of like in the in the in the mids um, but I think you know certainly when it comes to Americana I would say that maybe the importance is in the production process is in the selection of the instruments um, that you're using I think that's where you go some way to defining your sound and I think maybe that's more um, I don't know I'm not a, I don't do uh, Americana um, and I haven't actually yet ever mixed any Americana. I've done folk, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking from my own personal point. I probably wouldn't tailor my um, what I do based on um, based on the, the genre. More a case of you know, well maybe yeah, maybe I would, but I, yeah, sorry, can't be more help on that. Um, right, so that's it. Thanks very much for tuning in. If you've got any more comments or questions, by all means, whack them in the comments there, and I'll address them now. If not, hang on, I've got a little banner. Um, if not, you can drop me an email, um, library at larkmusic.com. 
Um, I'm doing, there's another one of these tomorrow night and Friday night, and I may carry on into next week if there is the demand. Um, but um, yeah, if there's any specific issues that you have, challenges, questions that you face when it comes to producing music, marketing music, uh, writing music, mixing music, uh, PRing music, uh, listening to, no, I'm not helping you listening to music, um, but anything at all, um, hit me up either in the comments to these videos or at library at larkmusic.com and I will endeavour to get back to you as soon as possible. Um, yeah, thanks very much. Have a lovely evening. Bye!